Well, hi everyone. Well, there was another dramatic building collapse, this time in the Bronx of New York City. A seven-story, 46-unit apartment building had the entire corner of the facade of the building, which consisted of brick masonry, collapsed to the ground. It appears that this may have been a progressive failure that was very rapid, a cascading failure, starting with perhaps the ground floor level and then progressing up through each subsequent story of the building. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about the details that are available associated with this collapse at this point, and also tie it into some other collapses that we've seen in the last few years involving buildings. Uh, and fortunately for this case, uh, no one was seriously injured and, and no fatalities occurred. The uh, fire department did a very thorough and rapid job of combing the debris for potential victims, and they've concluded that no one was trapped in the debris, which is a huge relief. This building was located at 1915 Billingsley Terrace, again in the Bronx. And this building collapse has a lot in common with the Davenport collapse, an apartment building that killed three people, as well as the Surfside condominium collapse in Florida that killed 98 people a few years ago. So I'm going to talk about the similarities here. Now, in this instance of the New York building, it was known that the masonry, the brick facade, had a lot of distress, a lot of problems. It had been cited, or the building owner had been fined as a result of these problems associated with the building, and I'll, I'll list what they had indicated. But uh, there was an engineer involved, and here's a, here's a great article from the city that talks about this building collapse indicates that the engineering firm, Konigsberg Engineering PC, had noticed issues with the building back in 2020. But because of the shutdown in 2020, uh, he returned to the site in 2021 and found that no repairs had been done to the building whatsoever. Again, that's very reminiscent of what happened at Surfside. So scaffolding was put into place so that this engineer could take a closer look. Unfortunately, the scaffolding was only erected along a portion of the facade. This article indicates that in 2020, they checked the facade using binoculars and a digital camera. They also tapped on the bricks with a hammer. Yeah, and you could do that if it has a hollow sound, that means it's loose at various locations across the building facade. But there's a note here in this article that limited hands-on inspection involving erecting scaffolding to get an up-close look at the bricks did take place, but only on one section of the building. Even though this location was selected to be representative of the remaining facade, conclusions drawn regarding the remaining portions of the facade may not be done with complete certainty. This article goes on to say, The engineer noted that while nothing of the building was imminently hazardous, the building was considered unsafe because prior conditions cited in earlier inspections had not been corrected and there was significant masonry damage throughout the facade. So again, going back to the Davenport collapse, which resulted in three fatalities, the masonry uh, facade of that building was undergoing repairs at the time of the collapse. So apparently a repair plan had been submitted on behalf of the building owner to the city and the city hadn't completed their review in order for repairs to proceed. Apparently this building was bought in 2004 for $3 million by a limited liability company called 1915 Realty. So I did a recent video about the collapse of a retaining wall in Vancouver area of Canada and some of the questions I was raising was, where was the government inspections, the city building officials, uh, relative to that retaining wall collapse? Here's an instance where building officials were well aware of the problems associated with the facade of this building and had not pushed for evacuation or emergency repairs, perhaps because there was uh, underappreciation for the risks involved. And again, I talk about this in a number of videos, but I think in general, People are poorly equipped to assess risk. And usually it's the engineer's role to ascertain what the degree of risk is relative to their scope of services. But the problem is there's not a lot of rigorous training in, in risk assessment, either in school or in practice, in terms of what I find. The other thing is there can be blind spots. You could be focused in your area of specialty and fail to appreciate other aspects that could contribute to a problem like this that's outside your area of expertise. So again, the fire department did an amazing job combing through the rubble very quickly. You know, to the extent that these kind of problems occur, you certainly want 
a fire department as experienced and uh, gutsy, as, as it were, or brave to, to rush in here like this and affect a rescue if necessary. You know, you know, there's a question as to whether the remaining portions of the building are stable. So the fire crews put themselves at considerable risk going through the rubble looking for potential victims, not knowing whether additional collapse of the building could occur. I mean, there was a giant pile of rubble at the base of this building. So I'll continue to follow this story and provide updates as more information is, is gleaned about what led up to this disaster. And although, again, no one was killed or apparently no one was seriously injured either, but it could have been an altogether different story. I mean, this collapse occurred, from what I understand, yesterday, December 11th, between around 3.30 to 4 p.m. So that's a time where our people could expect to be in stores walking along the sidewalk. I don't know... Uh, you know, a lot of these disasters seem to happen at night. And in this case, it's fortunate that wasn't the case because there's likely to have been far more people uh, a home, at home or in their, in their units asleep when the collapse occurred. And you can see in some of these photos that the, the edge of the building now is right up at the uh, edge of somebody's bed. So quite a scary situation. So again, these stories kind of point out the overall degradation of our infrastructure. I mean, these buildings were put up over 100 years ago, and it seems like today people are doing good just to, just to maintain them to an adequate degree. Then you've got the issues of engineers. Do they take on limited scope and expose themselves to liability by examining only portions of the building? And of course, there's parts that they couldn't see no matter what. Should the distress at the exterior of the building led someone to suspect that there could be other problems, more structural problems with the building? Did the involvement of building officials with the city uh, delay repair efforts? Should the city have pushed for emergency repair or even evacuation? I mean, I can appreciate not being too pushy for those kind of things if you think the building's safe, but if there's a question, people should be removed from the situation uh, as a as out of abundance of caution but again you, there's all these pressures in places where housing is limited it, you just don't want to move people out uh, on an unfounded basis and put them out on the street but again this could have been a far worse situation it could have been very much like the surfside collapse please check out the link in the description of my digital download for the top civil engineering disasters of the last 100 years Thanks for watching and please stay tuned for future videos.